Good morning, and welcome to day two of the National Conference on Ending Homelessness. Please welcome to the stage the Alliance's Chief Equity Officer, Chandra Crawford. Let's do a sound check. Oh yeah, I can, I can hear myself. <laughs> okay, I'm just gonna give everybody a second. Because you know what, it's so exciting to be together. Well, welcome back for day two. How are we doing? <laughs> I know it's early, I know it's still early. Well, it's been so good to see all of you. and. Uh, Basis too. Uh, so let me give some people some shout out because as we're here, we want to make those connections. So let's see who we got here. We got Dr. Valicia Adams Callum. <laughs> you know, she bought her whole crew from California, right? But look, why I'm giving her that shout out because I love it. So she's restructured. How, at her agency, she's restructured how she does the hiring, and she's employing people with lived expertise. That's right. That's right. So I'm just not talking committee membership, y'all, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, but she's employing. And let me tell you what I always tell people. A stipend is nice, but a salary sure ain't bad. So thank you, Kish. Right? Right? Now, 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 we're going to talk about partnerships today. You know, you want to know how to tie all those behavioral health strands with housing, figure out those streams. Hit up Marcus Cannon, Riverside, California, right? He's here. So we want to make those connections. Make sure you're pulling people aside as there are things that you're working on. Let's get to know one another. All right? And then... I've seen some new faces. And yesterday, when our CEO said, who's attending the conference for the first time, I was surprised. Hello, I see you. <laughs> I was surprised to see how many new people. And that is so exciting. Thank you. Uh, and so let, let's give some more shout outs. So look, we got Laura from Charlottesville, Virginia. So later on today, she's going to talk to the people attending her session about rethinking service provision and how we meet the unique needs of BIPOC populations. That's right. And yesterday, whoo, fire. That's right, fire, 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 fire. And so yesterday, to end it up, coordinated entry, we had, uh, let's see, Delmar, that's right, from Pierce County, Washington, challenging us to think out the box to redesign our systems. Delma, where have you been all my life, right? <laughs> and thank you, Regina Cannon, for bringing that session together in HUD for that demonstration project. Right, we're learning, we're engaging, right? Okay, so let me tell you what I've learned uh, this day and a half, or day, well, not quite, because it's still in the morning, but you know what I mean. One of the things that I realized um, as we come together is how much we really need each other. Like, I needed to be around this community to be rejuvenated, right? We've come, we're still in a challenging time. Homelessness was always a crisis, and so obviously the pandemic didn't help it at all. Um, but these types of exchanges, uh, learning, connections, and partnerships, we need to do all that, and I hope that coming here, we're helping to foster that. So today, what we're gonna talk about is partnerships. So we've got some great folks from uh, at the federal level, our federal partners, and then we're gonna flip it up a bit at the end. We're gonna have a net, uh, panel discussion, and what we're gonna talk about, we're gonna talk about <clears throat> partnerships, but then how we ourselves work on par partnerships 
through power sharing. So I'm really looking forward to that panel. Uh, but one of the big points that I want to um, walk away with before I start to introduce our panelists is that this is really about, when you think about this plenary, us all working together and making those connections and building partnerships to prevent and end homelessness. So without further ado, <laughs> I'm going to bring up our first speaker, and that is Jeff Olivet. <laughs> Y'all know Jeff? <laughs> of course they know Jeff. So he is the current executive director of, uh, you know, we use acronyms, USICH. But look, I got to read the paper so I can, for those who might not know what that is, it's the U.S. Interagency Council on Homelessness. And Jeff, I loved reading your bio because you know what? I've known you for quite some time, but I, I didn't realize the range. So why I say that, <laughs> Jeff has on the suit, <laughs> he's the executive director, but Jeff has been a street outreach worker, I didn't know that, case manager, the gamut. So he's been out in the field, okay? So uh, we are looking forward to his comments, but I want to mention a couple of other things because of uh, long bio. <laughs> Just to tell you a few more things about him, he's the uh, founder of uh, the, the founder of Joe Consulting. I love that. Get it, Joe, J-O, Jeff Olivet. Very, very suave. <laughs> and the co-founder of Racial Equity Partners. Uh, done a lot of work on racial equity. And uh, when I first met him, he was the uh, CEO of C4 Innovations, uh, an, an agency that we love to partner with. And so without further ado, Jeff. Tell us about your work. <laughs> good morning. It is so good to be with you all here today. And so amazingly good to be here in person, isn't it? I, you know, after far too many Zoom meetings and far too few handshakes and hugs with old friends, here we are together. I, I heard there was a, a run on green lanyards yesterday, uh, which tells you something about our need for human connection these days. Uh, through your relentless work for justice over these challenging months. We're here together for the first time in a long time. And to those of you who have been in this movement for years or even decades, it is great to see you again. For those of you who are new to the work, we welcome you and we look forward to working alongside you. To those who bring your own lived experiences of homelessness, thank you for bringing your courage, your wisdom, and your resolve to every conversation. We need you at every table. We're grateful to the staff and leadership of the National Alliance to End Homelessness for all of your work. Uh, Nan Roman, uh, in passing the baton, I, I hope that, Nan, you carry with you into your next chapter our immense admiration for your advocacy and leadership over all these years. Your work has impacted so, so many lives. And Anne Oliva, I can't imagine any better choice to lead this organization into the future. Uh, I am honored to know you and excited to continue our work together. We are at a critical moment in our nation's work to end homelessness. The combination of unprecedented resources and persistent challenges has made our work as important as it has ever been. Sometimes the work can be tiring. It can be tiring when communities continue to struggle with too few resources and too little public and political support. It can be tiring when we're working in crisis response mode and we're spread so thin that it's hard to drive systemic solutions. It can be tiring when the incredible successes we see with tens of thousands of people, actually hundreds of thousands of people, exiting homelessness every year only to see those successes undercut 
when hundreds of thousands of people experience homelessness for the first time. It can also be easy to become angry. And we should be angry about some things. We should be angry that as a society we have failed so many of our friends and neighbors, so many of our brothers and sisters. We should be angry that the systemic racism and ongoing impact of redlining, continued discrimination in housing, jobs, education, health care, and criminal justice have led to staggering racial disparities in who becomes homeless, with black Americans and Native Americans most impacted. We should be angry that LGBTQ people whose rights are again brief and only one time doesn't matter when it happens to your family. We want to end homelessness altogether, and we will not be satisfied until every American Every child, every young person, every veteran, every senior, every individual has a roof over their head and a place to call home. In closing, let me say to those of you who are new to the field, and I saw all those hands go up yesterday too, we need you. We need your energy and we need your ideas. To those of you who have been at it for a while, we need your wisdom and your experience. Our work is not easy, but there is nothing more important than what you do every day. Your work is what counts, not the criticism of the cynics. Never believe anybody when they say that what you're doing isn't working. You know that it is. And you can say something that they cannot. I showed up. I did my best. So even as you take care of others, take care of yourselves. These have been really difficult times, and it's important that you continue to give yourself a little extra grace and that you give a little extra grace to those around you because we need you now and for a long time to come. Thank you. I wasn't kidding y'all when I said partner. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, and one thing I want to note that I, I love, because uh, we are going to be looking out for this plan, is that uh, the staff, uh, Jeff, they were really committed to getting input. And I really did appreciate all of the listening sessions and the outreach that they did, and how they also centered and uplifted people with lived expertise. They're not just talking, y'all, and that's what I mean by partnerships. Thank you. <laughs> All right, okay. So, uh, moving on, we have another federal partner. Uh, and, and I love that we have HUD here. I mean, we, we, they, 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 that's right. <laughs> Uh, I've been so excited every time a NOFO drops. I mean, look, we, we're right now looking at addressing unsheltered homelessness, right? Rural homelessness. Every time a NOFO comes out, I'm always excited. The level is always bumped up. People uh, with lived ex expertise are always highlighted, encouraging communities to do authentic engagement, racial equity. So. You know, they've just done a wonderful job. And so it's my honor today to introduce our next speaker, and that is Deputy Secretary Adrian Todman. Uh, yeah, let's give a round of applause. <laughs> a round of applause. And she's waiting. So I'm going to call her out, but I've got to say some more good words because just like Jeff, oh, she's been doing this work for quite some time, and she's been doing some really good stuff. So I want to make sure that you all know at least some of it, okay? So before she became, and she's the 12th Deputy Secretary of HUD, she was the CEO of NARO. And you all know in this housing field, we love acronyms. So I'm going to spell it out just in case uh, you all aren't familiar with that. Now, that's the National Association 
of housing redevelopment officials. And she was a big advocate for affordable housing. Uh, and so we applaud her work there. But uh, <clears throat> prior to that, she was also the ED of the DC Housing Authority, uh, where she oversaw uh, an award-winning um, model to house uh, veterans experiencing homelessness. She's held other um, positions at HUD, so she's not new to this. Uh, so she's been doing this for a long time, and we're so happy to have Deputy Secretary Totman as our partner. And I'd like to welcome you to the stage. Thank you for joining us. Yes. Good morning. Good morning. There we go. I will say that not only am I the 12th Deputy Secretary at HUD, I'm the first black woman to be the Deputy Secretary at HUD. You know, <laughs> I know my, my, my West Indian family is very proud. Let me say that. Okay, um, and let me say this. I am very proud, so proud, to serve with the secretary. Has anybody met Marsha Fudge? Anybody? Isn't she amazing? Ohio, Ohio is always in the house when she's in the house. Where, anybody from Ohio around here? Where's my, there you go. I'll, I'll let her know you said hello. But she is an amazing woman, a compassionate leader. In my just over a year serving with her, I have already learned so, so much. So it's an honor to serve with her as she is the only second black woman to serve as a secretary of HUD. So thank you so much for that introduction. And you know, I, I, I have not done the kind of work that so many of you in here do, but I have been on the front lines of making sure that there's housing units available and built for people who need to be housed. I've been on the front lines of making the voucher program easier to use for individuals and for landlords because we need them to use our vouchers. Um, so I've been in the front lines in a different way. But I will say this much. I have worked so closely throughout my career with people who are on the real front lines of working with our homeless neighbors and helping to really have folks build trust in you so you can help them as they travel through a very vulnerable journey. So thank you all. Thank you all for the work that you do in so many ways, in so many different places. I was so excited to walk in and hear the hum of an in-person conference. I think this is the first time um, in, since the pandemic that you have been in person. So congratulations. First of all, congratulations to you, my sister Anne. Let's hear it for Anne. I was so excited. I was so excited to hear that the baton was moving into your very capable hands, my sister. Um, so I wish you much luck on your journey. And I don't know if Nan is here or not, um, but I want to also thank Nan for her decades of service, not just to homeless, and let's get this straight, Nan's service wasn't just to homeless individuals, it was to all of us, those of us who are fighting, and those of us who don't even understand the leadership that she brought to this country for decades. So let's hear it for Nan, Nan as well. You know, we saw that leadership, we saw that leadership during the pandemic, well, we're still in the pandemic, aren't we? We saw that leadership during the early years of the pandemic. 
when so many of us had to think quickly and pivot from doing the normal things to doing things that was really going to impact the moment of time that we were in, from innovating and finding new ways like helping make sure our homeless neighbors were housed safely and putting folks into hotels and motels across the country and reducing the paperwork it would take to make sure that we were moving the housing system along. There's so much new that we had to do. But the part of the pandemic that I think really shook us to the core is when we were told, everybody, we got us, if you could stay home, right? If you had the luxury of staying home, that, you know, we need to stay home. And, you know, I turned to, um, you know, some of my family, you know, family members ne never really know what you do. I found that. <laughs> they really, I have told my daughter, who is 26, you, she, she should know better, 26, what do you do, mommy? I said, Lord, child. So, <laughs> but during the pandemic, when people were told to stay home, I was, it was easier to describe my job because people understood, home, yeah, I got one. I have a home I can stay. But I said, you know, think about the folks who don't have a home. Where were they going to stay? And I think that that experience for so many people in this country, in addition to the economic impact that so many of our neighbors across the country felt if they, when they lost their jobs or they lost some of their income. Because here's the thing about home and housing, and I said this to some congressional interns yesterday. It's so very fundamental, so very fundamental that we almost forget that it's there and then we need it, right? Many of us, we can clock out of work, jump in our car, metro, jump in a bus, go home, feels natural, you're on a rope, you know what you're doing. And it becomes so natural that we forget sometimes the luxury of having a home until something happens like a pandemic. And so many millions of people across the country realize, oh my God, for the first time perhaps, the vulnerability of, oh my God, I'm about to lose my home. You know? And they felt it. And for many people, sadly, many people, that's that vulnerability, that sense of fear was something that's so easily taken for granted, probably sunk in probably sunk in. But I tell you what, I am so, so proud to be a member of this administration, the Biden-Harris administration. And let me tell you why. Um, I've been around for a little bit. I got my hair colored last week, so you can't really tell. <laughs> give, it, give it a couple weeks and you'll see. And I have heard people generally talk in generalities about the importance of housing and the importance of taking on homelessness. Um, but this administration, this administration has taken on both, both in a very dramatic and urgent way. I'm going to speak, of course, to the work we're doing in homelessness, but if you have not yet had an opportunity to look at this administration's housing supply action plan, I suggest you do that. There has not been a federal action plan to build more housing until since the 70s, if I had to, if I had to gander. Since the 70s, a federal plan, you know, mayors and governors, particularly mayors, they have to deal with this every single day. There's an urgency. They, they don't have that luxury. But the federal government sometimes struggles in where its place should be. And to have and to 
to be able to work for a president and a vice president who said, this is so important to us that we are going to have an action plan on more housing supply is a unique and amazing thing. But some of the things that we also did is we made sure that we could deploy $46 billion in our emergency rental assistance funds. We know we had a slow start, but we got things going. And I really hope that many of you in here were able to work with some of the individuals and families that benefited from those funds. We were able, I'm particularly proud of this at HUD, you know, you know, you always don't get credit for the things that you do. You're really a prophet in your own land, right? But there are so many, so many homeowners who would themselves be potentially homeless, but for the work that the HUD team did to make sure that there was forbearances in place as they struggled through the pandemic. And then after that, made sure that there was a, what we call our loss mitigation waterfall, which is just fancy talk for people being able to restructure their mortgage debt and adjust it to what their current economic situation is. So many millions of families who are not struggling because of what this administration did. We worked hard to make sure that localities had the flexibilities they need to use their CARES funds. We deployed millions in ESG and really encouraging all of you who are working to deploy our ESG resources to do so with urgency. Can't emphasize that more. At HUD, we pushed out our emergency housing voucher program. And let me linger here a little bit. The, the take up for this voucher program, emergency housing voucher, has been phenomenal and successful. And we have 87% of those vouchers at work today. And I'm really proud of the team for getting that done. We also released, thank you. We also released $5 billion in home ARP so that we can build more units. You know, we, we have to deal with demand from a voucher side, but as you all know, we need to build more units. Our home ARP funds are busy at work doing that. We, we deployed our House America initiative, and thank you, Richard, who's here for your leadership on that, to make sure that we had a community of practice across 100 communities in 31 states, territories, and D.C., to make sure they understood how to really braid all of our programs together so that we were housing individuals who are homeless and we were helping to build the units that we need. And that's good work. And the leaders who are part of House America represent over 50% of the nation's homeless population. And together, they're going to rehouse at least 100,000 people and create at least 20,000 units with the work that they're doing. So keep an eye on them. Make sure they're doing it. We're very proud, it was mentioned earlier, that we really released our unsheltered homelessness and in uh, NOFO. And that's a one of a kind. That's a, we've not done that before at HUD. And I remember when the team briefed me on it, there was like excitement. You know, we're doing something new and it's, we think people are gonna like it. We think people are going to be able to benefit from it. So we're very proud to have been able to introduce a new tool into your toolkit. We also made sure, this administration also made sure that we rebuilt the U.S. Interagency Council on homelessness. And, you know, I know you just heard from my, my partner here, Jeff, who is a strong leader. I know him to be a strong leader. You know him to be a strong leader. And I know that under his leadership, we are going to move this council in ways and in places it never has before. Thank you, Jeff, for your leadership. And look, I, I want to share, I share these things, not because I don't think you don't read it in your newsletters. See it on social media? I know you do. I used to put those newsletters out. I know you know. But let me tell you why I say it out loud. Because it is important, now more than ever, it is important that we speak loudly and boldly and broadly 
about the work we are all doing. Because there are people, I'm not going to name names, but I could. Because there are people who prefer to pull down your work, to pull down our work. There are people who prefer to show videos of unsheltered people and put them on TV to scare the American people for their own political gain. There are people who just don't want you to succeed for, your own, for their own political gain. There are people who will belittle our work and question the value that we have placed on Housing First as our strategy because it plays well. Not because they care and they have a better idea, right? It's not like you say, you know, we have, we have a better idea, we've got a better mousetrap, here's how we think, mm-mm. Because it sounds good, it plays better. And plays on the worst instincts of, other, of some of our American neighbors. And there's a growing chorus of voices who want to undermine the progress we're making to address homelessness. They want to undermine the case for federal government's role and resources and involvement in solving this issue. And to win people, they just say bold-faced lies. I don't even say untruth. You know when you're growing up and You're growing up and, you know, I, you would say to, you know, he or she lie. I said, mm-mm, you're not allowed to say lies and untruth. But you know what? I'm grown now. <laughs> They're lying. Because they're opposed to any kind of federal assistance that we want to bring to bear to help. So the reason I talk about the things that we've done, the reason I talk about the American Rescue Plan, the reason I talk about emergency housing vouchers, the reason I talk about Jeff's work, the reason I talk about Richard's work and Anne's work and Nan's work, the reason I talk about the resource we have out there is because if we don't talk and have a solid drumbeat on what is actually happening, other people will fill that truth. So even if you disagree from time to time with what's happening, subsection C, clause A, 1, B, I don't like it. <laughs> you need to do something about that. You have to understand that in some situations, there's an us and there's a them. And if you want to make sure that the resources that you're fighting for and that we are deploying continue to be available. Now is not the time to be shy. Now you got to speak, lose your voices, use every tool you have in your toolkit to make sure that the work we are doing now continues in the years to come. You know, We can make, and we are making, a huge difference to end homelessness. We are. I know for many of you, it feels exhausting, right? You, you feel like you're making headway. You make, wake up the next morning and find out something else happened. You're like, oh, that's, it's not the direction I wanted to go in. Know that you have the full faith and backing of the federal government. We believe in the work that you are doing. We believe that you all are making a difference. We know that you are making a difference. And that's why my colleagues and I fight every day to make sure that you have the resources that you need to make that difference. And so let me close by saying that we can't rest and we won't rest, the secretary won't rest until we help every person 
every person in this country have a safe and decent place to call their home. You all stay blessed, and thank you for everything you're doing. the Deputy Secretary. Be loud, be bold. I love it. So look, I'm going to move us along into the final panel discussion uh, because we might be a little bit be behind time. And I know everybody's probably ready to eat a little something. But we definitely want to take a moment um, and have this good discussion because now we're switching it up a bit. We're talking about power sharing and people's lived, exp lived expertise. So let's bring out our moderator. So y'all heard we have a new CEO, right, of the Alliance, right? <laughs> I think you've got that point by now. So I'm going to introduce Ann Oliva, our CEO. That's right. And so I'm going to say a quick word before I briefly state Mark Jones, the bio. So not yet. Don't come out yet. This is going to be quick. <laughs> <laughs> so I will say I met Mark Jones at one of these conferences, uh, and when we first started to talk about racial equity, we started doing a track, and actually Mark and Jeff did a session together, and that was such a safe space, and we could talk honestly and open and talk about the system, not external factors in racism, but how we can exacerbate the problem, and I didn't want to leave, and that was such a good feeling. And so when we've tried to, as we've continued to build our racial equity work, we've tried to mirror that and make sure that we're bold, we're honest. And so I just want to thank both Mark and Jeff. But now, Mark, I have to say your bio, right? <laughs> but I have a quick line. So Mark Dones is the uh, CEO of the newly formed King County uh, Regional Homelessness Authority. Thank you, Mark. Woo! <laughs> I had to say that, Mark. We don't have a lot of time, but I had to give you a prop, right? <laughs> okay, and let me say this, honey. Last but never least. I got that right, Mark? Yep. <laughs> you heard him backstage. He said, yep. <laughs> So Marvin Futrell III, um, he is the Director of Policy and Strategy, uh, Washington Lived Experience Coalition and Co-Director, yes, 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 of the KCRHA uh, Unified Command Center. Marvin, come join the panel. <laughs> I'm going to turn it over to Ann. People are bringing it to this conference. Let me tell you, this has been an amazing um, plenary. And uh, thank you to, to Jeff and to Adrian. Um, and I am excited to have this conversation because y'all also always bring it. So let's just get right into it. Um, I'm going to start with you, Mark, and then Marvin, I'll, I'll turn to you. Can you introduce yourself? Tell us a little bit about your role in King County uh, in the homeless services system. Sure. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Mark. Um, it's good to be back with you all in person. Um, so, uh, Mark Jones, they then pronouns. I'm the CEO at the King County Regional Homelessness Authority, which is a role I affectionately refer to as Chief Cat Herder. Um, so, our organization's job, um, and I generally just always do the same thing, maybe. <laughs> Um, but our organization's job is to bring together uh, the resources of 39 cities and the county to end homelessness, right? Um, but specifically, uh, I had the privilege of leading some of the design work that led into it, and we are specifically charged with ending homelessness uh, through a racial justice lens and with the incorporation of lived expertise at every single level. Um, and that's in our founding legislation. Like, that, like, like we, we just got to do that. Um, and to that end, right, like our, uh, my staff is 70% folks with lived expertise. Um, we are over, we are over 50% um, people of color. 
um, we look like and are the community we serve. Marvin, how about you? Well, hello everyone. This is my first conference. Welcome. Welcome. Uh, when wanting to introduce myself, I didn't quite know how to say what it is I do. I spent most of the last 25 years working in community with folks experiencing homelessness. Our primary goal was always to empower people until change could actually take effect. Through that work, I was introduced to the Washington State Lived Experience Coalition and uh, thus new opportunities due to a lot of hard work from a yet another group of folks open doors that brought voices from the outside in. Uh, welcomed, I mostly feel welcome because I've been here for a day and a half and I keep hearing things we say all the time mm -hmm. now being echoed uh, by a group of folks I've never met, which is honestly a very empowering thing for me and I can't wait to take it back and share it with others. My role at the KCRHA is uh, a co-director of the Unified Command Center, um, which is being set up to treat an emergency like an emergency, and we go in homelessness as quickly as possible. Thank you. So Mark, you mentioned um, as you were introducing yourself uh, that you did some of the design work before taking the CEO job. I happened to work there with Mark, and it was amazing to watch. Um, sometimes frustrating, sometimes. It was great. Awesome. We had like, a great time. It was, it was great. Like, a great time between girls. Yeah, it was awesome. <laughs> um, so, can you just like, I, I want to get to the nuts and bolts of how this works because I think, you know, we talk about all of this in, in theoretical terms, but you're actually like, doing it together and that sounded wrong I'm sorry you're actually like doing this work you're doing this work together and <laughs> let me recover from that for a minute so can you can you talk a little bit um, about your approach good God um, <laughs> To integrating traditional power structure. You're in, you're in local government, so yep. you have to integrate traditional power structures with these new opportunities to share power with people who have lived expertise. Can yeah. You talk about that. I mean, I think, you know, um, hearkening back, um, when Jeff and I first began to have some of these conversations with you, with, you know, our colleague Amanda and Deary, who's right here. Amanda! Woohoo! Um, uh, you know, with Jessica Venegas, who's right there. Um, you know, oftentimes the, the response was, well, that's all theory, right? And I know that you and I have taken an approach, and you and I have had this conversation, which is like, it's only theory because you don't want to do it. <laughs> like, it's like very easy to do. <laughs> like, because, right, from, as you just said, right, like, for those of us, I've worked in government essentially for 15-ish years, right? Like, once you've been in long enough, you're like, this is just where this is. It actually isn't mysterious, <laughs> right? Yeah. And so when we talk about, like, what does it mean? I was somewhere uh, last week, and I said, listen, if y'all ask me to help you set up another advisory board, I will leave the country. Like, <laughs> I am just so fundamentally uninterested in that work. <laughs> um, and so when we talk about power sharing, we talk about the mechanics of power sharing, right? Like that is, right, 70% of the staff is people with lived expertise at every level, right? At all levels of management, like front, like everywhere, right? Um, I, like, you know, it wasn't until I took this job that I felt very comfortable saying, like, I am a person of, of lived experience, right? Like, I was hospitalized as a teen twice for, like, very significant mental health issues. I was ho uh, unstably housed in my early 20s. Um, and, like, so when I look at something, right, like, when I am doing my work in my office, it is as a person with lived experience being like, well, that doesn't make any sense, <laughs> right? That's what it means to power share. But going beyond that, right, then we integrate people with lived expertise in our board structures. So, like, up until very recently, I reported to someone who lived in a shelter. And 
The only reason I don't report to him anymore is because he came to work at the authority, <laughs> which I'm proud of. Um, but like, that's what power sharing looks like, right? And let me be very clear with you. Like, conversations get real, real when you're trying to say to a person who lives in a shelter, well, I think I want to do this. And they're like, that doesn't make any sense. That is not how any of this works. And if you are hearing me say that and you're like, oh, that's kind of scary, think about that. It shouldn't be scary to deal with the reality of our work unless that work has lost its reality. So, so Marvin, can you give us some really specific examples of what the partnership with people with lived experience looks like and what real power sharing looks like? That would take all day. Uh, I will try to point out that what was adopted is not what we see on a piece of paper yet. It is the idea that people closest to the problem are closest to the solution and they bring it to the table if it's available. Um, understanding that those in power have to be liberated gatekeepers. Mm. They have mm. got to open doors and welcome the solutions in. It's not a problem of caring. I've been here long enough and I'm looking across the sea of caring people who are engaged in a work that does not treat them well. Our systems need to change. The theorem of change is what has come up with the KCRHA. Uh, and its implementation is led by people with lived experience. The lived experience coalition design process at the tables, at work every day, trying to give meaning to the idea that people can make decisions for themselves regardless if they're housed or not. So, my concrete example is for since April 4th, I've gone to work every day, entered into rooms, welcomed at almost any table I could get to, and have in, 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 invited more because I'm here today because of work that thousands of folks did before me. Mm -hmm. We organized to change policy. We organized to get heard. Uh, LEC came in, organized to develop the KCRHA, organized to get board seats. And then someone asked me if I would serve. Sure. And I hopefully will always leave a seat for someone who will come after me because poverty, the overlying problem here is not going to go away. But homelessness we can solve. Can I have Thank one you. thing? Actually? Please. So, maybe two things. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, one thing that I, I, I think is really important as just a, like a concrete thing that a number of us worked on is our emergency housing voucher program, which I'm going to talk in a session later today. But so King County, right, like big, uh, often, right, like people are like, well, how could we house anyone? Because our vacancy rates are so low. But that's just not how housing works. Um, so our emergency housing voucher program was designed with the LEC, right? So. Uh, when that program got rolled out, there were like actually like four of us who worked at the authority because we were still very much a startup. Um, and we, so we co-designed the entire program. Our emergency housing voucher program is uh, one of the best performing in the nation. Um, it is, we are at 60% leased up, 75% issued with about 1,300 vouchers. Um, we... When we worked with the LEC, one of the things that we aligned on right early on was that we also wanted to use the vouchers uh, to uh, address literal homelessness, right? Like we wanted to say like people who are outside should be inside and that's what this voucher can do, right? And so to the extent that we often talk about what it means to incorporate lived expertise, right? We also executed like 80 MOUs with organizations that had never before received a government resource. Many of them were more in the mutual aid space, right? Um, the LEC itself helped distribute some vouchers. Like the, we could talk about some of our in-camera resolution work. But the, the point is, right, is all of these things happen better and faster 
because we co-design with lived expertise at all steps, right? And I just want to be really clear. I think there are a lot of things about our space that are explicitly political, and like, we can talk about that. But incorporating people who know best because they are closest to it is actually just good common sense. That's not an ideological stance. It is the stance of a public administrator who is tired and would like shorter days. <laughs> and the days get shorter if we listen to what people say and just do that. So, so let's take that conversation a little bit further. You started with um, you know, use, how you're using your EHVs. And I, and I want to talk about something that a lot of communities are struggling with right now. Um, and that's encampment resolution. You all took a unique approach specifically at Woodland Park, mm -hmm. which um, is, was a specific in, encampment. And your approach was not sweeps. And just about everybody received housing. Mm -hmm. So can you walk us through the nuts and bolts of how that worked and maybe how Marvin Howe co-creation um, or co-design worked? Honestly, I mean, I think like the nuts and bolts start with like before we even engaged like as a system with that encampment, the LEC was already there, right? And I think that it's really important because our work followed their work. It was not like we didn't like, so we got on a bandwagon. We didn't like direct the thing, right? Um, and the LEC had been at Woodland Park for like months organizing, right? Like do it, like going out every day helping to connect people with resources, helping to connect people with like, hey, how do we like work together as a community to like make some decisions? Who do you want to work with? Like, oh, like this outreach worker is coming in. Like, oh, do you not like them? We can give that feedback, right? Like we can run community process around some of these things that feel hard to do. And then when the authority engaged, our role was to say like, okay, what do you know? And let's just do what you said. <laughs> Right? Mm -hmm. So we pulled together an operational table that had at it, uh, you know, LEC folks, outreach team, et cetera, and we just started building out, you know, like a by name list, but of the encampment. And then we drove towards exits, right? Not like, you know, just disperse, but like exits to long term placements for every person. It took about four months, but like it was also a 90 person encampment that isn't there. And not isn't there because we just move people around the city. And so, like, I just want to be really clear that, again, right, like, there is a path to engaging with some of our hardest problems, but that path has to be through the vehicle of talking to people who know best, and that is folks who are going to be, like, with, with lived expertise who are doing that work on the ground. Yeah. Do you have anything to add to that? Well, yes, because there's this, uh, something new, because encampments, uh, I'm, I'm often concerned that people think that that's a choice. Mm. Those are folks that are forced outside in absence of community. Uh, we need to, well, we have started to look at organized communities and how we can support them. Mm -hmm. If everyone in this room went home and chose not to do this again, the folks I've had the pleasure of working with for 20 years, would still be organizing themselves in community. Mm -hmm. They would be helping each other, doing the peer navigation, doing all of these wonderful things that I get to learn new words for every day. We at, at the, the LEC taught me that we need to uplift what's already there to be part of our solutions. Um, I am hoping that I will be able to see more of these solutions come to fruition as Mark and others open new doors and we start new, well, we address old problems with new solutions. That theorem of change. <laughs> so that's all I had to add. That's great. Thank you so much. So I, I know that folks are anxious to get to lunch, so I have one more closing question for y'all. Um, what? Marvin, let's start with you. What final words of wisdom or inspiration do you have for our audience, or what do you want them to walk away from this session with? Just that. Uh, since the day I've started working in a job, I've reminded everybody I work with that the work isn't at your desk. 
You have to get out from behind your desk. You have to take a walk. You have to talk to your neighbors. It's not a number. Our community is waiting for us to, to do our thing, so. Same question for you, Mark. Um, I would say, you know, we've been doing this a long time. Um, and it is not an accident that there are three people of color on this stage talking about things that work. Um, I would say that when we initially started having this conversation many years ago, I remember talking to you all about meaningful transfer of power, which is what we're still talking about, right? And we have to stop talking about it. Go back to your community and give someone else the baton. Like, enough's enough, my dogs. Like, we can't, like, it is, it is, there is no theory of practice that is going to make this hard for you if you are used to having, or sorry, easy for you if you're used to having power. It's scary to be like, I'm not making this decision. Even for me, right? Like, I'm like, I'm a lady who makes decisions. <laughs> and like, there are times when I'm like, oh, okay, I'm not doing that. That's not my call, right? So like, you just actually have to do it. And there is not enough training in the world, there is not enough strategic planning in the world to help you viscerally understand what I'm just going to say to you, which is like, just give it up. And if you feel implicated, again, by what I have said, you need to sit with that. With love. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Marvin. Thank you, Mark. It is always such a pleasure to be with the two of you in the community. All right, Sean. This is definitely the closing, because I can't run up here again in these hills. So look, <laughs> headed to lunch. I just have a few announcements. Uh, we're hiring. So I want you all to go and check out our website, pull over a staff member, and ask us about those positions. The positions are in DC, but we are looking for great talent. Just two more things. Please remember to wear your mask. We're trying to keep everybody safe. Make sure you have your badges on. And just one last reminder, we do have COVID tests at the registration desk. So if you don't feel well, if you're experiencing any symptoms, please check out the registration desk. So I'm just going to say thank you for listening to the plenary. Enjoy your lunch, and let's keep learning, bonding, and connecting. Thank you all.